to, uh, to present to all of you. Um, so I'm just going to launch right into my talk. Um, so uh, this talk is, uh, I, I know this is a very diverse cognitive science audience, um, this talk is devoted to understanding um, uh, linguistic knowledge in a, at a range of levels of linguistic structure, but we're going to focus on, in particular, the role of both familiar and novel linguistic content, how those things come together. Um, and there are many levels of linguistic representation at which these pro the question of how the familiar and the novel come together, and I think actually language is a wonderful place, looking very broadly across the cognitive sciences, where we can see very general principles of how the mind organizes its experience with the world um, in a way that both uh, retains the level of specific detail of individual experience, but also generalizes from, generalizes from it in a way that prepares it to, um, to deal with new experiences and predict and anticipate and act efficiently in, uh, in the environment. Language is very pleased to see this. Um, it is an example of this, so I will look at, uh, just briefly illustrate from the level of phonology, the level of organization of sound systems and languages. Um, so when you create new words by putting morphemes together, you have to determine what the form is that, um, that the words come in. So for example, um, one of the kind of productive knowledge sources that we have, uh, in, uh, if, if, uh, if we know English, um, then the, the productive knowledge source is uh, that, that we know how to make plurals. It's a very one particular example. So in English, for example, if we know how to make plurals, then we know that if you are given a novel word, the word dax, which is not a word in English, but it could well be, has the right sounds, types of sounds to be an English word. And if you're taught that dax is a new word and it's a singular form, then you know from your knowledge or productive knowledge of the English language that the plural form would be daxes. But not every, of course, not every plural form is made by adding an is form to the end. So if the new word were blick instead of dax, then the plural form would be blicks, not blickas. Right? Um, this also works for familiar words of many types. So for example, the, uh, the plural form of the word trick is tricks, not trickas. But it doesn't work for every familiar word. So for example, the plural form of goose is not predictable systematically from this general rule. Rather, one has to know the specific content that the plural of goose is geese. That is a contingent fact about the language that must be learned specifically above and beyond the generalization. So we have generalizations that can be applied to both familiar and novel things, and then specifics, idiosyncrasies, that only can live on the familiar, because you must have experience in order to know them. Uh, similarly, we have um, these kinds of regularities in the domain of syntax as well. So for example, your knowledge that um, a noun phrase can be constructed by putting a noun together with any of the number of kind of determiners or articles allows you to know that, um, for example, not only is the mouse a legitimate noun phrase in English, and it's a phrase of English with type noun, but also a mouse is a legitimate phrase. Um, likewise, you know that a flu and the flu are both legitimate phrases, but you'll probably notice that that there's a difference between the way mouse and flu work with the words uh, and the, in that it's a little bit odder to say a flu than it is to say a mouse in some interesting sense. There's an idiosyncrasy that flu generally goes with the word the more so than other nouns. Um, this kind of knowledge is also productive. So if I tell you that there's a new word tufa and it's a count noun, and I indicate that by pairing it with the word a, uh, which only goes with count nouns, then you can use your productive knowledge of English syntax to turn it to know that the, the phrase the tufa, the, the word sequence the tufa, is also a legitimate phrase in English. Um, this also applies not only to combining your interminary nouns, but we see examples of this when we combine words using, for example, conjunctions like the word and. So we can create, we can from missing and maroon, the words missing and maroon, we maroon, we can combine them together, and we can combine them either as missing and maroon or maroon and missing. Um, so all of these are possible. So these are, uh, a lot of the, the rules that I've shown here are kinds of generative linguistic knowledge, the kind that allow us to produce and comprehend novel utterances. These are, there are many formal mechanisms for describing these. So for example, we have syntactic structure and then semantic structures that we can use to describe how words are allowed to combine and what the resulting meanings are. Um, they also allow us to account for things like systematic variations, like Perry gave Sam an apple and Perry gave an apple to Sam are nearly meaning equivalent ways of conveying the same meaning. Um, 
But there's also a potential role for item-specific experience in processing not in, in non-novel utterances. <coughs> that is, not every time we can, not every time we deal with an expression that we have to speak or understand an expression, do we have to necessarily construct it from scratch. We might memorize and just simply remember instances of our linguistic experience. And if that those instances include specific multi-word expressions, then we might simply be able to reuse this. Um, this works at the level of individual words. So for example, the past tense, my knowledge that the past tense of walk is walk is overdetermined in the sense that I could know that by virtue of applying the past tense rule that says the past tense of walk is becomes walk, but I also could just know it by just storing the form because I've heard that many times. You've all heard that many times. Like that. Um, likewise, uh, we have the, the word run, but run works differently. We cannot just know the form uh, the form, the past tense form of run by um, applying general rules, rather we have to store it. So this is an evidence of storage. Um, we also can see things, um, this in other kinds of syntactic combinations. So for example, the phrase, the phrase bread and butter is a pretty common uh, multi-word expression in English. And you might know that it is in English A because you can combine these words together using productive syntactic rules, or you might just have stored it. There are some cases of multi-word expressions that you must have stored it because you could not understand what they mean properly without having stored it. So kick the bucket means dies. Um, and you could not know that from semantic and syntactic composition. You would have to store that knowledge. So this allows us to set up to think about um, the role of productivity and its relationship with how things enter the lexicon. That is, what is the edge of the lexicon? And you can imagine that um, uh, in, uh, you can imagine a cline of expressions frequency from all the way out on the left past the slide to expressions that don't, you've never heard before. And so the only way you can actually know that they are legitimate expressions is through generative knowledge. And then as you have specific experience with more specific expressions, you, your knowledge can become more and more um, particularized and item-based. Um, and so this uh, really raises the question of what are the roles of these two productive sources of two sources of knowledge, productive knowledge and item specific experience. Um, and these are you can ask these questions under the assumptions of, language, of knowing the language has both compositional structure and idiosyncrasies, and knowing that people have finite language experience. Um, think about all these things together, knowing that language has this kind of rich productive structure, and that people have these have direct experience with many, many expressions, but that that experience is limited, sets up a prediction. And that prediction is that your reliance on your item-specific knowledge will trade off as a function of the amount of direct experience that you have with it. So for items that you have lots and lots of direct experience with, you should see very strong reliance on the particularized experience of that item. As that direct experience grows weaker, or grows less substantial, you should rely more and more on your general knowledge and that you continue this period. And this trade-off, one would expect, might be reflected in the processing, acquisition, and the structure of the multi-word lexicon. And I'm going to give you two case studies in two different domains today that describe the characterize this. I'm going to give you the illustrations of it. One is characterizing adult knowledge and also looking at the distribution of multi-word expressions in the lexicon, uh, or sorry, in, in the language. Um, this is work with Emily Morgan, who did a PhD with me at UC San Diego, is a postdoc at Tufts right now, and is moving to UC Davis to become a faculty member. Um, and then another case study on the childhood emergence of rule-based syntactic knowledge in early childhood. This is with collaborators at Berkeley, uh, MIT, Twitter, and uh, Stanford. Um, so I'm going to start with this topic, and this is about binomial expressions. So um, I'm actually going to test your, uh, your, your intuitions about ordering preferences. And um, this is a good opportunity for me, because I've never, um, I've never done this work with a bilingual Crowd so I I, uh, I don't know what will happen, uh, but I have some ideas. So we'll find out. So I'm going to give you two ordered expressions, and I'm going to ask you which one sounds more natural to you. Okay, and don't don't say it. Just keep it in your head, and then I'll take a poll. Okay. All right. Seamstresses and bishops, or bishops and seamstresses. Do people have preferences? Which one sounds more natural to you? All right, so raise your hand if it's the first one. And raise your hand if it's the second one. Okay, this is this is very characteristic. My monolingual English speaker statistics work very well here. So this is about a 70-30 preference in, in, in practice for uh, monolingual English speakers, and it's a similar preference. 
preference here. So this is the preferred form. Why do you have that preference? So I can tell you that unless you have seen me talk about this before, I'm very confident you have never seen either of these expressions in your life. <laughs> However, there are many reasons why you would prefer the latter or the former. Here are some of them. You might be biased to feel that um, mentioning more culturally powerful or prestigious central entities before culturally less powerful prestigious central entities sounds more natural to you. This is actually a very consistent generalization, and for a variety of reasons like stereotype, you know, gender stereotypes, the, the social power that bishops have versus the more you know, less prestigious professions of being a seamstress and so forth um, are, for better or for worse, at play in this example. Um, but there are also non-semantic characters uh, of these words that might play a role. So for example, you, it might be partly because you, it feels more natural to put short little words before long words. This is a general, um, this is a general characteristic of these word preferences. It might be because you prefer to put frequent words before short words, uh, before less frequent words. And it also might be because you prefer to minimize the number of consecutive unstressed syllables. So if you count the number of unstressed syllables, you have seen strong. Stress says and, that's three bishops, versus bid, shops, and seamstress. So it's at two versus three. Um, this has fewer consecutive ones than syllables. Okay. And um, indeed, uh, this is what most people will say is the preferred word. So that's one example. I'm going to give you a second example now. You ready? <laughs> meat and potatoes, or potatoes and meat? So, raise your hand if you think meat and potatoes sounds more natural. Raise your hand if Meat sound more natural? Good. Yes. Are you vegetarian by chance? <laughs> <laughs> well, I asked that because of the centrality. There's actually a principle to the principal reason for that. So I can ask you, why do you think that mean potato sounds more natural than potatoes and meat? Here are some reasons. One, um, you might prefer culturally more powerful <laughs> before before culturally, in this case. The, the meat is the centerpiece of the meal, the potatoes are sort of the side dish. And this is actually, this is such a gem, strong generalization that as, as an example of cultural centrality and power that it's, it's got a name, it's called the condiment rule from uh, Cooper and Ross 40 years ago. Um, you might prefer this order because uh, you prefer to put short words before long words. You might prefer this order because you prefer to put frequent words more in frequent, frequent words and so on. But of course there's one more reason why you might prefer meat and potatoes for meat and potatoes and meat which is that you've heard it many, many more times. Okay, that is a factor that is not at play in the bishops and seamstresses example, but it is at play here. In fact, if we look in corpora, so the now we have this, these amazing large data sets uh, that give us uh, the ability to look at frequencies of occurrence of these expressions. We can find that actually, if you take these two expressions, meat and potatoes is uh, far and away more common. It's 95% uh, more, more. It was 95% of the of the trigrams, the three word sequences that are either of these are meat and potatoes. And um, uh, so that's a very, very strong preference. Um, and uh, so one thing that this manifests is that even though, of course, your preferences regarding meat and potatoes might be purely, you know, you could imagine in principle they might come from these general principles. There actually seems to be something else that is at play, which is simply your direct experience with these things. So these are instances of the binomial construction. It's the, um, uh, it's the, uh, it, the, what I mean by the binomial construction is expressions of the form x and y, where x and y are lexical categories. And there are many different examples. Salt and pepper, hit and run, gold and silver, chicken and egg, skirts and sweaters, which and seamstresses, few and unfavorable, and so forth. These are all examples of the binomial construction. And some neat things about binomial construction um, obviously, they themselves are the consequence of productive knowledge. You just use combined two phrases of the same, the two now two lexical categories with the word "and." Um, they that's compositional. Um, furthermore, a new feature is that every time a binomial is used, <coughs> it actually manifests a choice about the order. So you get this rich data set of ordering preferences. And in fact, another neat thing about binomials is that although um, most logically possible binomials. You could practically combine any two words together. The vast majority of those those logically possible binomials, which number in the hundreds of millions, um, never occur. They never, the vast majority of them have never occurred in the history of the universe uh, as naturalistic productions. 
However, there are a large number that have, prefer, have occurred, and the ones that do occur, occur with many orders of magnitude of frequency. And you can see this in these examples. So, for example, we have cases that have occurred. So the Google Books n-gram data set is about 100 times, it's about 100 times more words than the lifetime experience to date of a college-age monolingual native English speaker. It's about, sorry, about 1,000 times more words. College-age English speaker, monolingual native English speaker has about <coughs> 300 to 350 in the ballpark, million words. Experience, this is about 350 billion words. And you can see that these expressions vary in many orders of magnitude. This is this is um, this expression is uh, in order of magnitude or so more rare than this, and so forth. And we can also get these very rich count data, and they actually comport reasonably well with your intuitions. I have a side question. So, raise your hand if you prefer the order of salt and pepper, and pepper and salt. Raise your hand if you prefer the order pepper and salt. Okay. Now let's do it in French. So I don't know French, but raise your hand if you prefer to put salt before pepper in French. And raise your hand if you prefer pepper and salt. Pepper before salt. Pepper before salt. Pepper before salt. Yes. It's interesting. So this is, a, I just wanted to take advantage of this. This is something you knew about. So, so pepper and salt is preferred in French. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, good. So this actually showed, this, this is another way of showing the, the real specificity of these kinds of preferences. And in fact, if you go back to the 19th century in English, the order of preference was pepper and before salt. Um, that is why it changed, I still do not understand, but it changed. So, um, so anyway, so you have these, uh, you have these rich corpus statistics, um, and we can combine these with um, some uh, psycholinguistic model, uh, so we can combine them with experimental techniques and computational modeling to really gain insight into the structure of the knowledge that we have about these things. Okay. So we can ask what determines these order of preference. So first of all, I'm going to give you a brief rundown of uh, some of the best understood productive knowledge sources that we have uh, that we understand play a role in um, in order in these ordering purposes. So I'm not going to dwell on these in great detail, but I just want to give you a tour. So um, these the uh, the roles of various factors has actually been investigated through these construction through this construction for many decades. Um, and here are some of the best the best ones. So um, there's a preference to to uh, of what's called iconic sequencing. Talk about what happens first. Before what happens later. Um, I, let me not go into the great detail here, but just for time. Um, you can ask me more about it if you this if you like. Put more animate, concrete, positive things before less animate, more negative things, and so forth. Um, in all these cases, these are examples. The examples that have no stars are ones that should reflect when the constraint is satisfied. The stars indicate examples where the constraint is violated, showing that none of these constraints are categorical. They're all gradient constraints. Power, but the more centrally, uh, culturally prioritized or powerful words first, including the condiment rule. Um, formal markedness, but words with more general or broader meanings first. No final stress, don't arrange the words so that the second word it has final stress. Word frequency, but the more frequent word first. Length, but the shorter word first. All of these things have a reasonable amount of evidence for them. If you look across various studies or even in one large course. Um, so now we're going to build a very simple probabilistic model of, um, of the, the way these ordering purposes work. And we're going to use, this is a very, this is not a fancy technique. This is something that is well understood. People use it all the time. Um, and it goes like this. So for any particular binomial expression, for each of the constraints that I described, there is, um, there are, are, imagine taking the binomial expression and choosing an order. With respect to that constraint, the order that you chose either satisfies the constraint, which I would illustrate in green, it violates the constraint, which I'll illustrate in red, or it is neutral with respect to the constraint, meaning that either order would, neither order would have a different effect on the constraint. So if you take two, so two final stress words, then for example, the, the stress constraint is inactive because both orders would <coughs> violate it. You use a logistic activation curve, so you put weights on these constraints, say how important each one is, and you sum up the weighted constraints, and then you pass it through a logistic activation curve. This is a standard, straightforward technique you see it in neural networks and in logistic regression. Um, and that gives you what we'll call a generative preference, which I'll denote here in this part of the talk by uh, the symbol mu, which says the probability with which you'll choose the particular order in question. And 
So nu is between zero. Um, and you can use this and then take a large data set of binomials, code the constraint values for the binomials, and then use uh, model fitting techniques to draw inferences about the value of the constraint. So in this case, almost every constraint seems to be to the right of zero, so meaning that it, it affects things in the way we predict. And by and large, the 95% conf confidence intervals also get you outside of zero, so we have reasonably good evidence for the individual constraints. And then when we put all these constraints together, we can ask how well do they predict the actual uh, corpus proportions. And you can see that it's it's not perfect, but it's not bad. It's about, it gets about 75% correct. Uh, and, and the R squared is about, uh, yeah, it's about so this is a hard problem, but it's not too bad. So this model, however, is not perfectly predictive, as you can say. And so um, if it's not perfectly predictive, then um, then a rational learner, somebody who, a learner that actually takes into account all the information that's available, should not only learn, they should use generative knowledge whenever they need to, but they should also, as they get more experience with, with respect to a particular expression, they should abandon the model specific, the model's predictions, or trust them less and less and just go with what they see for that particular expression. Okay. A good example of this is the expression ladies and gentlemen. So because ladies and gentlemen puts female before male, our model would actually predict that it's a dispreferred order, but it's obviously the preferred order. Okay. Um, and uh, once you've heard ladies and gentlemen enough, that's a manifestly obvious case. Why would you not pay attention to that information? Um, if you're trying to predict order and trying to use the order of the everybody else uses. So we try to understand. Um, we try to understand this. Um, uh, how how these knowledge sources, the generative knowledge sources and the direct knowledge experience, uh, are jointly put together by native speakers in determining ordering preferences in, in, in cases like this. So we'll just ask um, uh, very simple sentences. So we'll take these expressions and we'll put them in a sort of very neutral sentence context. Like there were many bishops and seamstresses in the tall small town where I grew up. That's not it doesn't sort of, there's not that much about the context that sort of implicates bishops and seamstresses in special ways. It's just a very sort of vanilla frame. And then we just ask people to, which sounds better. Okay. And so what we'll do is we're going to have our, we're going we're to look at the relationship between what our model predicts is the preferred order. In this case, our model predicts this one. And what people say is the preferred order. Okay. So um, this is the result. Now this is a small data set, um, and the results generalize to larger data sets. Okay. Um, I'm just showing you this very small data set. This is what the model predicts, and this is what people say um, they prefer. And you can see that there's a very strong close relationship, even with a small number of items here. It does, it does generalize to other items. And this is a highly significant result. Okay, so this works for novel binomials where people have never heard of it before. But now I'm going to go to a tested binomials. And with the tested binomials, ones that people do have experience with, we have to take into account the, the, not only the role of the generative knowledge, but also the role of the direct experience. And so those are two different knowledge sources. And they, in general, will tend to point the same direction. But they could point, they, they also could be different because of the presence of data experiences. So we chose some attested binomials that had, where we deconfounded, basically we, pulled, we tried to choose ones that systematically had differences between the model's predictions and the actual ordering preference, so that we could we could actually discriminate which one is playing a role in which case. Here's what we have. So we have three different types of expressions, and they vary in the overall frequency. That is the sum frequency of the two orderings. So you can think about these being expressions that we have a lot that you have relatively literal, relatively little direct experience with. Here's more, and here's even more. These are things like um, uh, here and there. Or gold, uh, I think gold and silver is either here or here, and there would be things like skirts and sweaters. Okay. So let me give, let me orient you to this. So on the x-axis, as before, we have generative knowledge. That's what our model our, our model predicts. On the y-axis now, though, we have direct experience. So this is what we find in a corpus. So if we were to take a random sample from a corpus, then there would generally be it would it would be that sort of cloud that looks like this that we saw before. But we sort of tried to pull them apart a little bit, so we were sort of selected. There's still a correlation, but we were a little selective about this. So those are the two axes. Now, the dots are what people are what people did when we were asked them which sounds better. 
this is really a 3D problem. We have two predicting variables, right? We have an x-axis and a y-axis, and then if we lay this down, then we have a z-axis, which is what people did. The way that I'm depicting this is that the coloring of the dots indicates the z-axis. So if I were to take these graphs and lay them down, the color of dot would be how high the point is. So high point, like people always say one particular order, low is always say the other order. I'm sorry, I should be clear. This number is actually what it says is the proportion of um, the proportion predicted of the alphabetical ordering. Of them. And I just choose alphabetical ordering so that that's an arbitrary convention, so that we can actually talk about which direction people chose. It's just sort of an orientation. Um, and so this would be this would say that the model binomials here, the model almost always predict predicts are almost always in alphabetical order. Over here, almost never in alphabetic order. And the corpus binomials that are here are observed almost always in uh, reverse alphabetic order. Up here is almost always in alphabetic order. Dots that are white are, are preferred by our participants in the experiment almost always in reverse alphabetic order. Dots that are black are preferred almost always in alphabetic order. So the coloring of the dots tells what the group is. So in general, you want darker dots up here and lighter dots down here, and that's what you see. And then the coloring is basically taking the shading of the dots and sort of fitting a smooth plane. It's just saying, okay, that's what, it's, that's what the general tendency is. So what we can see here is that for the low-frequency items, the coloring of the plane, which is sort of the putting a, putting a best fit through the dots, is the shading is horizontal, meaning that the influencing factor is the generative knowledge, not the direct experience. Okay. So people's preferences change substantially as the model predictions change, but not really as the corpus numbers change. So for example, this, is, this one is directness and truth. This uh, expression, if you look at where it is, the model predicts that it occurs in this order, which is the alphabetical order, only about 20% of the time. But in fact, in the corpus, it occurs in this order about 60% of the time. The shading is sort of a grayish, it's about here, so people chose it in the alphabetical order about 40% of the time. So you can see the influence of the, uh, the generative knowledge above the um, corpus. Uh, um, that, and what you see, if you put the model for this, you see that basically you can actually compare the sizes of these predictors. And you can see that the effective general knowledge is larger than the effective direct experience here, even though both of them have the same. If we go to the higher frequency expressions, now the picture is reversed. Direct experience has a very clear effect. Generative knowledge has an effect that doesn't reach significance, but you sort of see a, a diagonal line here is the best fit, meaning that both factors seem at least direct experience and maybe to some extent direct generative knowledge has a role. And then if we go to high frequency expressions, direct, it's a vertical climb. Direct experience has a very strong effect, and um, generative knowledge doesn't seem to do anything. So um, this tells us about the idiosyncratic in general. So we've just seen evidence that binomial-specific ordering preferences have cognitive reality for speakers above and beyond the generative preferences that are there. <coughs> so we can continue and we can ask, well, what we haven't said is we haven't said what the distribution of idiosyncrasies looks like. Okay? Um, we haven't talked about modeling both the generative knowledge and the idiosyncratic preferences simultaneously. And in order to do this, I'm going to give you a visualization of sort of what binomials like, look like in the language that turns out to be a useful visualization. Okay, and what it is, is it's the histogram of strength of ordering preferences. So if I take hundreds of binomials and I ask, just to look in a corpus, I say, what do their ordering preferences look like? It turns out that they have an interesting multimodal distribution. So there are a lot of binomials that occur a lot in both orders. And then there are actually a fair number that occur almost exclusively in one order or the other. But there are not as many binomials that occur in sort of like 20-80 proportion. Okay. Um, now, we can ask, so that's interesting. That's what we see in the data. What does our model predict? Does our model do a good job of predicting that? The answer turns out to be no. Our model is a very bad job. So our model actually predicts lots of binomials that have a moderate preference, but not a lot of extreme preferences. Okay, so our models are not this. So um, ordering the part, what that shows is ordering preferences depart dramatically from generative knowledge. And so we actually want to explicitly include that in the model. And 
And we're going to do that by extending our simple logistic regression model to a slightly more complicated model, but one that turns out to be very rich and powerful for understanding the structure of this data. And um, I want to do this. So here was what well, I showed you before, logistic regression. Um, so this was the logistic activation curve. This was the summing of the weighted constraints. Um, and we're going to revise it to include what's called a beta binomial component. So this is actually a pretty well understood model in statistics, but it turns out to be very useful. It has not been applied that much to, um, to these kinds of scientific language problems, but it turns out to be really useful. So here in logistic regression, what you do is you sum up the weighted constraints, and then you pass it through this logistic activation function, and that's your probability of a success. In beta binomial models, you sum up your weighted constraints, you pass them through a logistic activation fun, uh, function. And then what you do is you take, you define a distribution that draws a probability out of some distribution that is centered, that has as its average probability that, that uh, the outcome of the logistic curve. So one way of thinking about this is whereas, um, whereas the logistic regression defines a coin weighting, what's the probability of putting heads on a coin as a function of the properties of the coin? Beta binomial models define a coin factor. So you can imagine a bunch of properties say, determine as this factory produces coins, what is the distribution of weightings that the coins are going to have? And so you can think of every binomial as an individual coin. If the coins are all the same, there's no variability or idiosyncrasy in the coin production process, then the distribution, this distribution will look very tight. And if the coins are all different, then it's going to look different. So um, just to give you a sense of the beta, beta distribution, sorry, I'm missing some um, accent, some part of the legend, but let me explain this. So this is for the mean value of two thirds. A product, the average coin weighting has a two thirds weight. The beta binomial distribution, sorry, I should show you again, has this parameter here, which is new, and it's called the concentration parameter. And it tells you how concentrated this distribution is around the single value. When the concentration parameter is high, so I'm sorry I'm missing these lines, but basically like this ordering from top to bottom is like the ordering here, top to bottom. Okay. So the highest value, nu is equal to 30, is this very concentrated distribution. And it puts a, you'll notice that it puts a lot of probability mass right around two thirds. So think about this is a coin factory that does a good job producing weighted coins that on average have a two thirds probability of heads and very a little bit. As the concentration parameter goes down, the variability increases. And as the, when the concentration parameter gets really low, you get what's called a sparse distribution, where it's very unlikely to have an intermediate weighting, and it's very likely to have an extreme weighting. Okay. So what the beta binomial distribution allows you to do with the beta component is it allows you to, specify, to say what's the varying, and imagine this is a whole bunch of different binomials. It allows you to vary the level of idiosyncrasy. So what we're going to do in our model is we're going to let, and, and we're actually going to explore the following question. What is the relationship between the overall expression frequency of a binomial, that is, let's say, the sum's total counts of, say, pepper and salt and salt and pepper, that overall quantity of experience and the, the degree of idiosyncrasy which the binomial is likely to exhibit? Okay. And we do this by letting the concentration parameter of the beta distribution vary as a function of, its, of the overall frequency of the number of the What this looks technically like, this is one that's a parametric, that, that is that we constrain the shape of this function to look in the following way. We just say that, that the concentration parameter is an exponential function of an intercept plus a slope times the log of the frequency of the binomial. And then we also have a um, non-parametric fit, and you'll see both of those. Um, and so here's the way that this works. So we start off the same way as we did before with the multiple weighted constraints. We pass it through a logistic activation curve. We get a generated preference. But the additional component that I've added is that we have this beta binomial distribution, this beta distribution, and with a concentration parameter. And from the beta distribution, with this particular mean, you draw a actual binomial preference, which is specific and idiosyncratic to that binomial. So this part of it captures the systematicity. And this part of it captures the idiosyncrasy that lives on top of the systematicity. Okay. So it has both the systematic and the idiosyncratic components. This, if you've used a hierarchical or a mixed effects model, it actually has quite the flavor of a mixed effects model. We have a systematic component and a stochastic component to the 
property of any individual. Then, how do we know what these parts, what these components look like? What are the weights? What is the concentration parameter? We do that by fitting this to data, and we use Bayesian inference techniques, the fairly standard Bayesian inference techniques to fit the parameters of this model. The first thing I'm going to show you is what do we learn about the level of idiosyncrasy? So, as I showed you on an earlier slide, small values of this parameter are very, there are lots of idiosyncrasy because you get a sparse distribution. Okay. So, we can ask how does this parameter, what is this parameter, and how does it vary as a function of the frequencies of the binomials? And um, we, uh, we can look at this, and here's the frequency of the binomial expression. So, to the right is more frequent. Here's the concentration or sparsity parameter, new. And here's the parametric fit. And what you see is that as the expressions get more frequent, the sparsity, uh, the concentration parameter goes down. So you get more idiosyncrasy as you have higher frequency binomials. And this is also true in the non parametric fits. This is actually quite a decent parametric fit. Um, so, so this is a new discovery. This is not something that's been observed uh, rigorously before, although there is an intuition about it, which I'll go into in a minute, that has existed for a long time. This is frequency sensitive regularization of binomial order in preference. So here, let me give you now some specific intuitions of what this really is like. So let's think about truly idiosyncratic binomials that actually are not only idiosyncratic in terms of what order they prefer, but actually their meaning is not even compositional. So as a really good example of this is by and large. By and large means mostly. There's no way you could recover the meaning of by and large from the parts. Furthermore, large and by is simply not English. Right? We can also go on. So here and there. Here and there, although its meaning sort of relates to the sum of the parts, it's definitely something added. There's definitely something added. Here and there is not just in those two places. It's in a, it's in a relatively small number of places. It doesn't even have to be here. It could be over all over there, here and there. Right? So there is a departure from the meaning as well as of, uh, there's a departure of the meaning in these extreme cases. Likewise, with here and there, there and here is English, but it definitely does not mean the same thing as here and there. And you see this as in as things become um, uh, as become things become more frequent, they also fairly often have a tendency to just freeze into one preferred order. Okay. Likewise, another example of this would be cat and mouse, a game of cat and mouse. You would never see a game of mouse and cat. And so what we see is as expressions become more frequent, they seem to like to have just one ordering or the other, not to have both. So, and this is, uh, once again, anecdotally, this has been described by linguists in the past, but it's never been studied quantitatively before this. So we can also ask, well, we've made our model more fancy. Does it do better? The first question is, does it do better at predicting individual ordering preferences? And the answer is not really. This is our old model, this is our new model. Does that look better to you? <laughs> so it is a little better in the following way. You'll see that um, this model is a little more compressed, so there's less down here and there's less up here. And this model is a little more fully diagonal. Okay, so it's a little better, but it's not much better. The reason for that is that this mo the new model doesn't really, I'm still, I'm testing the model by not letting it see. I'm asking, let's pretend that the gold and silver is a binomial that I've never seen before. What should its ordering preference be? And that's a hard prediction problem because these things are idiosyncratic. So we haven't really improved the ability to predict that individual binomials. But now on the other hand, let's look at the distribution of binomials that our model predicts. This is the reality once again. You saw this in our old model. This is our new model. So now we have a really big improvement. It's still not a perfect model, but what you see is it actually starts to recover the multimodal structure of the ordering preferences. So you have a mode in the center and you have some peaks on the uh, edges. Okay. So this is a big improvement in fitting the overall histogram of binomial ordering preferences. So this is a pretty, I, I'm very fond of this discovery. Um, we've, demonstrated, uh, uh, we've demonstrated that there is frequency sensitive regularization. This might remind you a little bit of morphology. So in morphology, there is this generalization that irregular words are generally are frequent. So, for example, if you think about it in English, what are some irregular words like give, be, uh, take, and so forth? These are frequent words. Infrequent verbs like, uh, you know, um, amble are generally not infrequent, are not generally not irregular. And the reason is if they were ever regular in the past, they lose it. They lose the regularity. The irregularity cannot persist. It's a little bit like this. You're seeing the same thing in the following way. 
a binomial that's more idiosyncratic, more idiosyncratic binomials are more frequent. So you might say, well, a binomial loses its idiosyncrasy if it's not used over time. But there's an important difference as well. There's a, so there's a relationship, but there's an important difference, which is that in the case of morphology, if something is irregular, there are many, 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 many ways it could be. And so you have to just memorize, you have to learn what it could be. But with binomials, there aren't many, many, many ways it could be. It's just one ordering or the other. So you still, and interestingly, you still see this sort of hallmark of frequency sensitivity in binomials. But what we haven't done is explain where that comes from. Okay, and so we're actually going to, I'm going to tell, give you a little bit of a, a, a tour of, um, of uh, evolutionary models of language um, uh, that helps us understand that. So um, I'm not going to go into full detail on this for, the, not for matters of time, but I want to point out that Regularization has been widely recognized as an important mechanism for language change. It's been studied, it's been it's observed in, say, creoles. It's also studied in the lab. Children do this, um, both naturalistically, they turn pigeons into creoles. They also regularize in the lab. However, regularization is, a uh, frequency dependence is not sort of a first order feature of regularization. So it's not that children, it's not children or people in the lab regularize things more, the more, like, because they've heard them more. It's not like it's, the, it's not like there's an inference of, oh, this is frequent, therefore I'm gonna, I want to regularize it. That doesn't happen. Um, we're gonna propose that actually this frequency dependency of regularization is actually an emergent property of the interaction of individual cognitive biases and cultural transmission. And let me just say what this looks like. We're gonna do this with iterated learning models, which are models that are becoming increasingly prominent in models of language change. And they simulate the evolution of linguistic knowledge across generations. A summary way of the, how this looks is you have a speaker, they have a little model in their head, they have a grammatical model, we'll call this a probabilistic grammatical model. In this case, it's imagine it's a model of just one binomial expression. It says, I think that this, this expression is 80% of the time in one order. They use that to speak and they produce data and the data is drawn from this distribution. Somebody he learns the language by hearing from it. They hear data and they have a prior distribution, so they use Bayesian inference, and they come to the, a new conclusion about the grammar, which may be the same or may be different. In this case, it's a little different. They speak and that happens, so on and so forth. Okay. Um, and this paradigm, uh, this modeling paradigm, allows us to ask questions like, over time, well, how does this parameter evolve? Like, how does it tend to change? Um, so over time, if it starts out at point A, maybe it could wind up like this, maybe it could wind up like that. Who knows? Uh, depends on what the Okay. Um, more formally, uh, this is just a formal instantiation of this. Um, we're going to uh, say that people have a hypothesis. This is a, basically an ordering preference hypothesis. Every generation, they'll produce n tokens, where n is just the number of times the binomial is used, and they produce some set of them in alphabetic order. That set is drawn by, is determined by the binomial distribution. Now this is statistics, not linguistic binomials. They, they happen to have the same word. Um, and the binomial distribution has the coin flip parameter and the size. And um, the listener draws this, draws conclusions about this using Bayesian inference to draw a new hypothesis about the ordering preference for the binomial and so forth. Um, we're gonna use the beta distribution as that prior. I'm gonna skip over this for detail. Uh, you can ask me more about it later. It's the same data distribution that I'm using in a slightly different way here. Um, and uh, let me just ask the question of, does this standard model predict frequency dependent regularization? It turns out the answer is no. So what I'm giving you is I'm giving you simulated results of let's, at each, so I'm doing many, many, many different simulations over of the following way. I start with a single binomial, and it has an ordering preference when it starts of 0.6. I then, generate n examples of it per generation, and I have a Bayesian learner learn, uh, learn, learn from it, knowing that the most, a priori, the most likely value is 0.6, but they have some uncertainty. And so then they learn from the data, and then they themselves reproduce, they reproduce, create new data, and so forth. I do this over hundreds of generations, and then I look at the end, and I look at where that binomial landed. It might have been landed right back at 0.6, it might have landed at 0.4, and then I do that many, many different times. So I have some binomials landing at 0.6, some at 0.4, and so forth, so I can draw a histogram or a density plot from that. And this is what the density plot looks like. And you can see that it actually looks the same regardless of the number, the size of n, perhaps counterintuitively. 
Um, so the, si the, the frequency of the binomial expression does not affect its distribution in the language in the basic model. And this actually turns out to be a mathematically proven result that was already known. Um, <laughs> regularization is not frequency dependent on the standard model. So this is just a simulation version of the mathematical result. So we augment this model with what we call a regularization bias. Now this is a regularization bias to produce more regular forms, but it's a frequency independent regularization bias. So, so the listener and the learner are not consulting the frequency and the expression to say this is a frequency expression therefore I'm going to regularize it more. They regularize it a certain amount across the board. So the way this works is it's very similar to the previous version. The speaker has a hypothesis, they produce some tokens, they produce n tokens, some of them are in alphabetical order. The learner learns on the basis of that using Bayesian inference, but then they apply a regularization bias. And they start with their hypothesis theta, but then they transform it into something that's a little closer to zero or one. Okay, and that's the regularization bias, and then they continue on. What does this regularization bias look like? It's a mild depart, so it's a mild Categorical mild stretching of the distribution, pushing values of theta closer to zero or one. So the diagonal solid line is alpha equals one. That's the version of this model that has no regularization bias. When alpha is equal to two, you can see a substantial regularization bias. So something that started off as being learned at 0.75 might be mapped to 0.85 or 0 0.9. And then smaller numbers of alpha below five are smaller and smaller regularization biases. So as you can see, the 1.5 regularization bias is really quite small. Okay. So we can ask, does this augmentation predict frequency dependent regularization? Um, so we do this in basically the same way. I'm going to show you results of alpha is equal to 1.1 for now. Um, and there's uh, 500, we do this for 500 generations, many different simulations. Um, here's what we got. Um, so the dotted lines are exactly what you saw before. Nothing's different. The solid lines are now the augmented model with this extremely small regularization bias. When you have small, when you have low frequency binomials, rare binomials, you can see that there's no appreciable effect. The regularization bias doesn't do anything. But when the more frequently, the, the more frequent the binomial, the more strong of an effect it has. You start to see departure from the original distribution. And that gets more and more strong. And actually, if you have a super frequent binomial, you can actually get you can actually get a preference for the opposite order to emerge, not just the, not just the generatively preferred order. So you can have you can see either direction. And so regularization is frequency dependent on the augmented model. Um, and this is actually a really cool, I think, theoretical result. Um, it shows that regularization bias could be frequency independent and still give rise to frequency dependent bias. Um, because of the tension between the prior and the specific knowledge that then interacts with the bottleneck of effective cultural transmission. If you bring in an idiosyncrasy, but the right binomials are used rarely, there's not enough history of the binomial to carry the idiosyncrasy across generations. But if a very highly frequent binomial does have enough history to it to carry an idiosyncrasy across generations. So, this is one example of emergency of dependence, and, and what we show is that this happens even with a very weak regularization bias. Finally, in this section I want to show you, this actually allows us hits to quantitative data. Uh, so here's our corpus again, histogram of ordering preferences. There are two parameters in this model. There is the regularization bias for alpha, and there is the concentration parameter of the prior, how strong people's prior beliefs are about, basically how, strong the, how strongly they apply generally. And so here is different values. Here's more regularization going to the right, stronger effect of the prior, stronger effect of generative knowledge going down in the learner. And you can see that, that the behavior of the model depends on these two parameter estimates. But you can see that there's actually a good region in which there's a pretty, pretty substantial region of the model in which actually the quantitative shape of the histogram of ordering preferences actually looks really like a really pretty decent fit to exact to actual English. So at appropriate values of this model, we correctly predict the multimodal distribution of the corpus theory. So that's cool. Um, so that was binomials. Um, I showed you that strong inductive bias and rivalry preferences even among novel binomials, but we have binomial specific idiosyncrasies that are represented by speakers. These idiosyncrasies are strong with more frequent binomials, and the idiosyncrasies might be coming from a mild cognitive bias plus the bottleneck effect of cultural so in the remaining minutes of the talk, um, 
I want to talk just very briefly about the emergence of syntactic productivity, the emergence of that generative knowledge in early childhood. Different topic, but you'll see a lot of the same themes. I'm going to use a different, um, uh, I'm going to use a different construction instead of binomial expressions. I'm going to use noun phrases consisting of determiners and nouns. Very, very simple case. How does this productive knowledge itself emerge, and what's its relationship with the item specific? An adult native English speaker knows things like these are the same one simple category, this category is being combined freely with nouns, and what I'd like to know is how does this knowledge emerge? And this is actually a topic that has been studied quite extensively, um, and there's actually a lot of controversy about it in the um, language acquisition literature. And I will describe the two camps in the following approximating ways. On the one hand, we have what might be described as the rule driven child. Okay. On this view, children at the very earliest stages of multi-word speech are speaking using something very much like adult-like syntactic categories. Things a lot like noun phrase determiner or noun. And so they might have rules in their mind that are like this once they've learned specific words that instantiate these rules. If I wanted to make this probabilistic so that I could put I could fit into a corpus, I would just put probabilities on rules. Okay, that's perfectly fine. We know how to do that. We know how to do that. So this is a probabilistic rule-driven child. And um, the um, one of the hypotheses associated with this um, with this view is that this productive knowledge is present, emerges and is present very early. So as soon as the child is talking in multi-word expressions, they're doing it in something like this way. This camp is um, exemplified by researchers like Virginia Bailey and Charles Young. Um, on the other hand, we have what might be called the item driven child. Okay. On this view, this, they have a very different view. This camp has a very different view of um, how multi-word expressions are produced by young children. And I would describe it this way. So the child is presented with an ocean of linguistic input, and it takes a while to identify content in it. Early in language acquisition, the child has not been able to exhaustively analyze the input, but rather they're able to pull out islands of, uh, in which the, that they can make sense of. And so for determiner noun combinations, they might have pulled out of this example. For example, they might have pulled out a ball, the ball, and the doggy, but they haven't quite managed to pull out the doggy yet. Okay. So whereas in this case, you have sort of systematic coverage of both determiners for every noun by virtue of the structure of the rules, here you can have missing pieces. This, uh, in this view, productive knowledge, representations like this emerge more gradually. And they're, they're after this island-based stage. This point of view is exemplified by researchers like Frank Monticello, uh, Julian Pine, Elena Lee, and others. So how does one adjudicate between these two positions? So this is actually, there's been a lot of work trying to adjudicate between these two positions on the basis of child productions. Okay, when, how do child children actually speak? It's hard to go do a, like a lung test, like actually try to get the child to produce these things, because children of two, eight years and less are struggling to produce multi-word expression in the first place, let alone say the doggy just because you want them to use the word duck. It's hard to actually just do that. So um, here's the way that thing, but children do use these words. Um, and so we can just look at opportunistically how they're, how they're being used. And so here is, um, uh, here is uh, the way the previous two year analysis have worked. So um, you might look at, uh, ask, which nouns does a child in a particular data set use at least once with the word a? Uh? And that might be in a particular data set, bat, ball, bat, balloon, and toy. And which words does the child use at least with the word the? And that might be ball, toy, flu, clock, and dog. So then you compute a score, which is called the overlap score in this literature, which is the number of words in this region divided by the number of words in the entire literature. So this would be two sevenths. So you have 28.6% overlap score in this analysis. Now, the problem with this approach is that and the idea is the higher the overlap score, the more productive the speaker is, because a really productive speaker would freely use lots and lots of nouns with both. And a, a, an island-based learner would maybe not have learned to use, there might be a lot of nouns that they only learned to use with one of the determiners, not with both. So that's the idea, and you look for high overlap score being productive child. The problem is this score is hard to use, because most of the nouns are low frequency. And so like if the noun has only occurred once, then there's no way it could occur with both. Right? And in general, if the noun occurs only three times and it happens not to occur with both, that's not really strong evidence, as strong evidence as it occurred 50 times and only used one, for example. 
So there's a lot of argument in this field as to how to most appropriately mean the overlap square. And so, for example, Charles Young came up with a model that he said he said instantiated a fully productive learner, um, and he said it gives a really awesome prediction of what the overlap score should be um, according to some particular assumptions. Here's what his model predicted. Here are these critical values. What a great fit. On the other hand, you had in the same year, you had Pine et al. 2013 said, no, 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 you have to you have to be careful about how you do these overlap score computations. What we're going to do is we're going to take a particular child, split their, their split split them into early half, later half, make sure we have a controlled set of nouns that we're looking in both times so that the changes in what the nouns they use aren't influencing things, and then compute a corrected overlap score. And they say, oh look, the overlap score was lower early and higher late, and so the child the child has become more productive. These are very, very difficult analyses to do. Um, and so we are taking a fundamentally different approach in this work. So we're actually trying to leverage the point, this continuum of, of possibilities of how these two knowledge sources are combined. And we take into account both the fact that there are productive sources of reasons for <coughs> nouns to be used differently. They occur in different contexts, and different contexts demand different, um, uh, different Determiners, or if they don't understand the relationship between the context and uh, the um, and the most appropriate determiner, they might just be using them systematically in random variation. Children actually do a fair amount of that um, in uh, in laboratory studies. So, you know, um, that's one thing they can do. They might have context driven productions, but there's another kind of um, another kind of thing that they might take that needs to be learned in order to fully command the, the language, which is the idiosyncrasy. So, for example. The idiosyncrasy that you catch a cold, but that you catch the flu. You know, so that's an idiosyncratic difference. Both of these things have to be known to achieve full uh, confidence in the language. Um, now, in terms of analyzing data, our starting point is that syntactic productivity should not, you should not go try and measure it directly by calculating a statistic from the data. Rather, you should try to infer it. It's a latent property of the data. And here's a particularly important reason why it's a latent property of the data that has to be inferred is that actually the reason that a child might use the term determiner and a noun in a particular combination together is going back to the original theme of the talk, there are two reasons. One is that they might have direct experience with a particular determiner and noun combination and just reuse it. And the other is that they might have a generalized productive knowledge. So the right thing to do in our view is actually build a formal model of how a child could combine these two knowledge sources, fit it to the data, and then ask, what did the data tell us about how the child, what this knowledge source looks like? And that will tell us about how productive knowledge emerges over time. And this is now one that we're using not only the child, not only are we using a model-based approach, but we're using also, nobody had ever done this before, not just the child data, but its relationship with the caregiver data that the child is hearing. Because that's an important form of concern. If we know the child is never hearing a ball, but they use the ball, that tells us different things than it would if we knew the child was hearing a ball. Okay. So we're using that kind and so the vision here is that we're trying to map out how the child gets from its first multi-word utterances to adult competence. Did they sort of gradually develop productivity? Did they rapidly have did they have rapidly and immediately emerging productivity early? Did they overgeneralize and ignore idiosyncrasies early on? Or do they do any of many other things? Do all sorts of things. Who knows? The idea is to create, build, map out this hypothesis space, the space where you have the rule-driven child and the item-driven child as extremes and see where the child is at various points. Okay, so that's the vision. And we do this with a probabilistic model, which is a little bit like the one I showed you for the binomials, but it has a little more stuff. This part of it looks a lot like the binomials model. You have a preference, a determiner preference and, uh, for, for nouns, and we're assuming that in this version of the model, all nouns have the productive knowledge sources say all nouns do the same thing, um, because in general, that's a productive use of determinants of nouns does. Uh, there's a strength of that knowledge, which is the concentration parameter, the beta distribution's concentration parameter again. Um, but we have this other source of information, which is the direct experience. The child, the child learns from data. They observe that noun that they're, we're talking about being used with, with particular data. Um, some of that data we as scientists observe, lowercase d. Some of it we don't observe, we'll have to impute. So we have to take into account the fact that we don't know exactly what the child says, but we got a sample of what the child says. That actually tends to be quite useful. And then the child has some efficacy level of being able to learn from the data. So they might not be able to learn perfectly from the data because their memory's not great and they haven't learned how to parse things correctly and so forth. 
So we have an efficacy level uh, that modulates how children learn their thinking data, and then they have predictive knowledge of any particular form. Um, we formalize this with the beta distribution as before. We formalize this with beta binomial. So this is another beta binomial model. So it's the same technique as I showed you with binomials case, but I'm using it for a slightly different end here. Here I want to infer the strength of the child's productive knowledge at any one time. Um, I'm not going to, so there's a very complicated slide here that sort of gives you intuitions about how this model functions and the kinds of things that the inferences it draws the data. You want to ask about those details, ask later. I want to just now very quickly, because uh, of time, tell you about the data that we used and about the results that we had. So the data that we used, we basically used a superset of all the data that everybody else used and augmented it with this human speech on purpose, which is a very, very large, dense data collection from the MIT Media Lab, where the estimate is that, like, I would say we have about maybe a third of everything the child has heard and said in their first three years of life. Um, okay, uh, we, in every case, we split the data set into the first half of the child's data and the second half of the child's data, and then we look to see what the inferred productivity levels are in each case, and we ask, what confidence, what can we, what conclusions can we draw with more confidence about the change in productivity? from the beginning to the end. And this is what we find. I'm ordering the children in, the, this is a fairly narrow range of children, this conservative analysis for throwing out children that are difficult, whose data are difficult to analyze. This is ordered by the first data of the child. So the young, the child that's youngest in the first part of the data is on the left, and the child that's oldest in the first part of the data is on the right. Um, these are, the y-axis is the change in syntactic productivity. So if it's positive value, the child became more productive under this model. The long middle line is the mean, the estimated mean, 93% confidence intervals, 99.9% confidence intervals. And so you'll notice that, um, that actually we can be confident in positive and upward change only with dense data at an early age. That's the only place where we have really strong evidence for increases in synaptic productivity. We do have some things that look like actually decreases in productivity over time, sort of more adherence to item-based information. Um, and we can also, um, and then there's one other thing to see, which is that basically there's sort of a downward trend from the left to the right. The older the child is, the less it seems like they're increasing over time. And we can actually plot that out this way. So this is sort of a, we've taken half the child's data in all cases. We plot that their age in months. This is the productivity levels. And if we very, very tentatively try to pass a curve through this, it looks like early on there's increasing productivity. You can see this very clearly in the speech on child. And later maybe there's a little bit of decrease in productivity. But I think that the data are far from conclusive. This is not conclusive. So uh, let me just summarize that, um, that's because that's really the big summary slide. So for syntactic acquisition, um, we've seen these two sources of knowledge. Once again, direct experience and productive knowledge. We've com contributed a novel formalization of the contributions of these two knowledge sources. I think that the main conclusion we have is that, that people on both sides of the, in both camps, are being too confident in their the data that are available do not conclusively or strongly adjudicate the CBI in the focus child. But um, there is tantalizing suggestive evidence that if there is any strongly item-driven determiner plus noun production, it's in the earliest months of multiple um, But And if it, if it is there, then syntactic productivity emerges very soon after. Um, and just to sort of sum up, you've seen these Bayesian models that allow us to actually build sort of cognitively informative representations for language structure. Um, they integrate, hopefully, both natives to construct uh, insights. We can use them to construct learning theories and apply the models to contemporary large data sets and infer empirically where human learners are on the continuum of realism to constructivism. Um, and so I want to end by acknowledging my collaborators, uh, funding sources, my lab, and all of you. Thank you for listening.